Welcome to Digital Nation, your weekly burst of inspiration from the best of local TV. Whether it's the creator of Sherlock Holmes learning about poisonous plants or a walkway of the stars in Birmingham, we reveal the things you don't normally see anywhere else. This week, we meet an artist from Cardiff who's produced a unique portrait of a music legend. We cheer on Mac the Seal in Glasgow as he's released Back Into the Wild. And we get familiar with Get Carter in Tyne and Weir. Loving local? Then let us know what you think by using the hashtag DigitalNation. Mastering the art of freestyle football takes time, practice, and you've got to be prepared to make a lot of mistakes. World champion John Farnworth knows that all too well. And in our first clip, Bay TV in Liverpool joins the role model on his inspirational tour of Merseyside schools. The message I always have, you know, it, everyone says it, but it, I believe it is true. The more you practice, the better you become. And even now I have days where I'm like, I can't get that. How, how am I meant to learn that trick? Like, how has he done that? How, how do I learn that? Um, but I always go back to it, the root of it, breaking it down. And I've realised that that's no different than maths, English, science. So if I'm ever in the school environment, I always say, I'll, I'll even show the children tricks that I can't do and, and make a mess of it and say, well, this is, this is how I live, like, I, I live for making mistakes because I know that all their mistakes will make up. I think the second that you think you've got it all, you might as well stop. Role models like John are absolutely first rate because the children are inspired by him. He has got special skills, but the main message that he was getting across was that um, it's important to have a healthy lifestyle and it's important to practice and, you know, if you keep practicing, anything's possible. If he, if he just inspires one child, he's made a difference to somebody's life. And that, will, that wouldn't have happened if he hadn't come into our school today. And who knows, with a bit more practice and support from his pupils, Mr Carney could become freestyle football's newest star. Can you guess which stars of sport, stage, screen and literature were born in Brum? Well, wonder no more and take a wander down Birmingham's Walk of Stars instead. This special walkway is a constant reminder of the local people whose fantastic achievements reach far beyond the city. Big Centre TV reports. Take a stroll down Broad Street and you can't miss this. The Walk of Stars. It recognises individuals who've made a significant impact in the world of entertainment, sport, business or literacy. This time, two sports stars are stepping into the Birmingham Hall of Fame in the form of tennis player Ann Jones and cricketer Dennis Amos. Oh, it ranks very highly. You know, I've always lived in Birmingham and uh, it's a great, it's a great honour. I've looked at a few stars over the years as I've walked along the pavements and yeah, I thought it would be lovely to join them. And now I have and I've been very, very happy. I'm not exactly a teenager anymore, so it's nice that people remember and uh, it'll be there for a, for a long time, I suppose. And uh, it'll be, yes, it's a great thrill. The former Wimbledon champion and Warwickshire and England cricketer joined the likes of Ozzy Osbourne and Chris Tarrant with the prestigious star. Jasper Carrot, also a winner, believes it's important to recognise our local sporting talent. It fills a gap because we have, we've got footballers up there but we haven't got any tennis players or any cricket players and so uh, this, this writes, not a wrong, but it writes something that should have been done a few years ago. I think this city um, falls down in recognising the talent that comes out, not just sport, but sort of uh, obviously entertainment, but also industry. And I think it's time we started to shout a bit more as to who was born here, who's proud to be a Brummie, and, and get that out into the, into the national press. You know, it's, it's Birmingham, we, we don't want to say too much. Well, hell with that. We've got some fantastic people out there and they need to be recognised. It's a wonderful award and uh, very proud, very proud to be a Brummie. Uh, lived here all my life and uh, worked here most of it and uh, no, it's, it's, it's very, very special. There haven't been many sportsmen who have won this award and it's lovely to have won it with Anne. Our careers run alongside one another. I used to watch her play and I think she came down occasionally with, with um, you know, Pip, her, her husband at the time, and uh, they used to watch, watch a bit of cricket. So we took an interest, we met at sporting events, our children went to the same school, so it's just super that we, we've won it together in, in the same year. Soon the names of these two sporting legends will grace the pavements of Birmingham, but there's always room for a few more. Over to Tyne and Weir now, as presenter Peter Durant talks to actor Kevin Wathan, set to play Jack Carter in a brand new stage adaptation of the British screen classic Get Carter. The original film was shot on a quiet residential street 
and brought a touch of movie magic to the daily lives of local residents. Well, we've arrived at the famous Las Vegas guest house, and the gentleman who'll be taking bed and breakfast there is the lead role in Get Carter. It's Kevin Waitham. Hello there, young man. Hello, Pa. Big shoes to fill, Sir Michael Caine. How are you feeling? Rather, yeah, good, good. <laughs> really good. Um, yeah, big shoes to fill, but I'm looking forward to it, Pa. Yeah. How do you take on a role like that when you know that somebody like Michael Caine's played it? Do you watch the film or do you ignore it and go to the writer? Well, what I like it's best to get, oh, it's best to be all encompassing, you know. So you've got to take elements of the film. Obviously, where it's happening more, it's more based on the book, which obviously ex explores more the psychological issues between him and the brother, what makes Jack the way he is. Um, but yeah, I'll be taking. I'll be taking inspiration from the main man, yeah, of course. Hey, when you come in to actually see Aye. these iconic places, that, that must actually give you a thrill and think... Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, in, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm doing this for real. I know, it's great. But as well, like, obviously, I'm sure they didn't have the, the UPVC doors in there. They would have back Wh then if where, they where's the land? It. Where's the landlady next door? That's what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it's great. It's great to see, you know, because it really gives you... A, a feel for the era, yeah. a feel for the environment. And yeah, yeah, you can just really get, get into it, get your teeth into it, yeah. <laughs> I hope I do it justice. <laughs> now, a gentleman who actually saw Get Carter being filmed is Tom. Tom, what was that like to have Hollywood stars coming knocking on your next door? The first time they came, it was two big black limousines came on a Sunday night in the summer. Uh -huh. And they all got out and they were looking at this house, but they, we didn't know what it was for. <laughs> then the next thing we knew, the whole, because there was nothing over there. Uh -huh. It was all the street was pulled down. Then all of a sudden, from the top to the bottom, it was all caravans and canteens and everything. And how long were they here for? About three months. Eesh. And they finished filming in October. And, that. and so Michael Caine was here. How weird was that, waking up in the morning and seeing this Hollywood star? Next door. Well, he always used to park his car here. It was a <laughs> big Rolls Royce, and used to sit there in it. You know, at the time they were he was making the film in that. You know. Did you get to have a chat with him? Yes. He what came, did he say? Just came in, just just an ordinary fella. Writer and physician Sir Arthur Conan Doyle studied botany in the 1870s, and his expert knowledge of poisonous plants certainly came in handy when bringing to life his most famous fictional character, Sherlock Holmes. But how did the legendary detective know what few other people knew? It was elementary, my dear Watson. The great detective Sherlock Holmes once said, it is my business to know what other people don't know. But how did the detective know quite so much about plants and poisons? Well, the answer lies right here, where Sir Arthur Conan Doyle studied. This is Edinburgh's Royal Botanic Gardens. We were looking for personalities that we could use to link together uh, some of Edinburgh's collections. We have a, uh, an archive collection here at the Botanic Gardens that maybe not many people know about. So sometimes by, by linking them to, to big names, you can make them more well-known. Arthur Conan Doyle had done a medical degree. You had to do botany as part of your medical degree. Once we knew that he started in 1877, well, we got the class rolls out and there he was. And there you are. So what, what did you find out about him through all of this? Was, was he a good student, for example? He seems to have been a, a very regular student, with very regular attendance here. Two days off through to sickness. Oh dear. But then, that's okay, <laughs> we can learn that. Apart from that, yes, he turned up to all his lectures. Uh, they'd have been coming here, I think, two days a week uh, to study botany, and that would have included uh, going on excursions as well mm -hmm. with the professor. How do you feel uh, being associated with the association <laughs> that associated Arthur Conan Doyle with Sherlock Holmes? It's quite thrilling, I think, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. To actually see his name and actually see his name in his own handwriting. We've got here, I thought it was, it was quite a thrill. And these are the herbarium specimens that we have at the Royal Botanic Garden. Um, we've got three million specimens from collected from all over the world, going back to 1697. That'll take some looking after, I should think. It does, <laughs> yes. <laughs> when Watson first meets Sherlock Holmes, and he says that his knowledge of botany covers extensive knowledge of um, poisons, including uh, opium and belladonna, but no knowledge whatsoever of practical gardening. At the time that Conan Doyle was studying here, he would have um, been learning about um, a range of plants, and he might well have included belladonna and opium. So he was basically writing yep. about himself <laughs> yes. in the persona of Sherlock Holmes. Yes. Brilliant. The shock passing of musical legend David Bowie early this year left generations of music fans bereft. 
and as the world went into a state of mourning, Cardiff artist Nathan Wyburn decided to pay a tribute to the late icon by using some very fitting materials, synonymous with the superstar performer himself. As an artist, you document things as they happen through time, especially the pop culture work that I do. I thought I had to make a portrait of David Bowie, so I thought, what material should I make him with? Uh, makeup seemed the most fitting because, obviously, of, of his elaborate dress sense and um, exaggerated makeup that he was quite well known for using. So, yeah, it's just seemed perfectly fitting. I got it done within three hours and straight onto social media. I always remember the lab that filmed The Labyrinth more than anything. Um, my dad was a huge fan of his music, and I know that a lot of artists that I like have been heavily influenced by him. So he really has been one of those ones that I think someone quoted before that there isn't an artist alive today that wasn't influenced by him. And that kind of makes sense because he was so iconic throughout his entire career. Um, I just think he really broke a lot of boundaries for a lot of people today to feel free to express themselves in the way they want to. And that brings us to the end of part one. But before the break, it's quiz time. Which city produced well-known musical acts, the Human League, Pulp, and the Arctic Monkeys? Was it A, Manchester? B, Leeds? Or C, Sheffield? Join us in part two for the answer. Welcome back to Digital Nation. Before the break, we asked you, which city produced well-known musical acts, the Human League, Pulp, and the Arctic Monkeys? And the answer is C, Sheffield. Sheffield is proud of its city's musical ambitions, having produced many chart-topping bands, including Heaven 17 and Def Leppard. Each month, local TV unveils a feast of new shows, and at Made in Leeds this month, it's no different. In this next clip, we check out a Digital Nation favourite, presenter Mark O'Brien, as he gives us a look behind the scenes and a sneak peek at some of the channel's more energetic content. Hello, I'm Mark O'Brien, and this is our look at some of the highlights, the lowlights, and the wish we'd never switched on the lights this month on Made in Leeds. Our top stories tonight. Oh. That's why he just wandered into shop. Panic at we Northern Monkers. Presenter Steve program. Shanahan is assaulted by a small woman. I was elsewhere, and I just wandered on over. And I'm very glad to have you here. And a fresh-faced Andy Seddon gives a masterclass in presenting from a Ferris wheel in his Leeds student TV days. There is a queue of many, many, many people right down there, and uh, quite frankly, I think there are uh, a bit many with us actually because this is our second go on the ferris wheel helena biles star of everyday yoga here on made in leeds who's produced some five minute workouts that we're showing all this month on the bucket list and just lift those knees up off the mat maybe even sort of walking it back and holding it here into a plank pose for a bit now i've seen helena biles out on the town and i know she enjoys a good night like you and me but i can't imagine helena sitting in the angel on a sixth pint of taddy lager at the end of a hard day before cradling a box of 20 chicken nuggets like a newborn on the bus home i want a fitness show on which the host has to struggle and suffer I want to see Beth Christa Wilson presenting a show about becoming a basketball pro, Steve Shanahan learning to fight a heavyweight boxer. I want to see a chubby, wheezing pie enthusiast shown how to get fit on TV, getting punished with an electric shock if he enters a chip shop, being made to run up the town hall steps. Next, we travel to Belfast to hear from Jack Agnew, a young athlete whose determination and talent has enabled him to win big at the Brazil Paralympic School Games. NVTV talks to the three times gold medal winner and future Paralympic hopeful for the 2020 Games. I'm 16 years old and I've been doing sport for 10 years. Back whenever I was in primary school and even um, at the start of whenever I got into secondary school. Whenever it came to like sports day and stuff, I was just given a whistle and 
told to set them off rather than me actually competing with them in sports day and that actually put me down, you know, it was kind of bad because I wanted to be out there and competing with anyone else and I suppose it gave me motivation as well. I started love playing wheelchair basketball, I started whenever I was about six years old and I've always, I've always been brought up with a mindset of because you're disabled doesn't mean you can't do anything and that's always motivated me. I've always thought, oh, they, someone who's not, hasn't got a disability is able to do that, so why can't I? So Jack's such a great ambassador now, he's getting a lot of profile. He's been a fantastic inspiration for younger and older athletes as well. I mean, how many people come back with three gold medals? And it's absolutely phenomenal. But, you know, he's just going from strength to strength. He's only been doing athletics for two years. So can you imagine what he's going to be like in another two years' time and come 2020? And, you know, we want to see him at the next Olympics and to be shouting and cheering because, you know, uh, the Paralympics got as many spectators. And it was just, I was absolutely riveted to the TV watching it. And this time we want to see Jack winning gold medals at the Olympics as well. We love a heartwarming tale of a rescued animal on Digital Nation. And in this next clip from STV Glasgow, we go one further, as Mac the Seal is not only brought back to health, but we see his rescuers watch like proud parents seeing a grown-up child leaving the nest. Yep, Mac is back and ready for the wild. Mac came in when he was just a, a young seal. He'd been found injured and he also had a big problem with worms as well. He's over, well over 30 kilos now, so that's his kind of target weight for him to go. He was only just about eight, eight kilos when he came in as a, a young sick pup. He's a bit of a character, so he's got his own wee traits. You know, does wee tricks for you every so often, swims upside down. But aye, uh, he's been doing well. Hello, pal. Quite curious, he'll go in. Take him in the crate, yeah, down in the van, down to Port and Cross Harbour. Usually we wait and try and get it high tide so it's easier to get into the water then. So, and once we get down there, we just put him in the water and open the, open the door and let him go. Sometimes they'll, have a wee, they'll hang about a wee bit, but usually once they get the, the smell of it and they, they see where they're going, they're, they're pretty happy to get out there and go and do it. He'd been used to being out there doing his own thing. He's only here really for a bit of recovery, really, until he was ready to go again. So he should be quite happy to go back, back to his home. It's always a good day to, to release something. Anything you're letting go is always a, a good success, really. So for everybody to come and see him go is quite, quite a good thing, really. Knife crime and gang-related violence are big issues in many cities across the UK. And now a campaign to end knife crime among the youth of Sheffield has arrived, along with a specially designed knife disposal bin. We hear from Sheffield Live about this new community initiative. The knife bin is part of a national uh, initiative that was set up by a guy called Clive Knowles, who's based at British Ironworks in Wales. And last year, he wrote to the Home Office and he offered the, to supply free of charge and to maintain and install knife bins across the country to areas that have been designated under the government's um, ending gang and violence areas. Following the riots of 2011, the government commissioned a report to try to identify areas in the UK which were deemed to be uh, at risk of gang and uh, youth violence. They've been successfully installed in London, Wolverhampton, Sandwell, Birmingham and Manchester. What we did as a campaign, we worked closely with uh, centres like One Nation and we listened to the council leaders here, you know, the local councillors, so to speak, and we, we listened to the community and we felt that we needed to do this. Sheffield has a comparable knife crime rate to other uh, similar cities. So there is a knife, we know that, and we know that by speaking to young people in this community, we know that they carry knives. We also, what we try to do is try not to, to bring in punitive measures all the time. We look at the reasons why young people are carrying knives, and we know that it's a problem across cities, especially in large uh, urban conurbations where um, usually young people carry it for protection, but they might be involved in a bit of 
trouble or beef, as they call it, with uh, rival gangs. They carry it for the protection or because it's seen to be cool to be, do, to be carrying a knife. But we also know that carrying a knife also makes you more likely to be stabbed by a, by a knife as well. So we try to educate young people. So we're not saying that Sheffield has got a massive problem with knife crime. We're saying the UK itself, Sheffield is no different to other similar cities. It's not just a United Kingdom, it's a truly creative kingdom. And here's why. In 1830, an engineer from Stroud called Edwin Beard Budding spent his time fretting over a man bearing his scythe. No, it wasn't being morbid. That's how people cut the grass back then. And it was a bit rubbish. Then one day, at a local cloth mill, he noticed a bladed roller that trimmed off the bubbly bits which gave him an idea. So he nipped into his shed, had a bit of a bash about with some wrought iron, and invented the lawnmower. The first one was sold to the Regent's Park Zoological Gardens, and it soon became a necessity for every sports club and every other shed in the world. Shame he didn't call it a beard trimmer, but never mind. Proof once again that when it comes to creativity, innovation, and cutting it fine, it's Stroud Mint. Finally, over to Cambridge TV for all you ever wanted to know about space. Local school children have been following closely the story of Britain's first ever spacewalker, Tim Peake. The British astronaut has captured the imagination of local young people, and they're now taking up the exciting challenge of Mission X. Ickneald Primary School in Sawston has been taking part in a number of space-related projects since the start of Tim Peake's mission as part of the National Space to Earth Challenge. Cambridge University physicist Dr Helen Mason led a series of workshops exploring questions about the mysteries of space. We're working with the uh, children who have been working over Christmas on space theme. They watch the launch of Tim Peake. We've got the space suit here, soccer space suit, and they're trying that out and asking lots and lots of questions. We need to get um, children interested in science, excited about science at an early age, which is why primary school is actually a really good age to target. Uh, and Tim Peake's mission is seen as an opportunity to do this. It's really exciting, he's a very good communicator, and it's an opportunity to engage children at different levels in um, space, in science, in, in related activities, technology, mathematics, things like that. Even the very youngest students took part in the workshops. Children as young as three learnt how an astronaut controls their spaceship and, perhaps more importantly, how to go to the toilet in a spacesuit. Parts of Tim's, um, Tim Peake's Principia mission is really trying to inspire the next generation of astronauts and engineers and scientists. Not everybody can be an astronaut, but a lot of young people hopefully will be touched by his programme and his the inspiration from going to space and might well think about, oh, actually, I might want to go into science or I might want to think about engineering or I might want to think about communications. So the different STEM careers. And starting them with this age is, is lovely because you can just see them beginning to touch the space suit and be able to picture themselves in different careers as, as, as they get older. And that completes our roundup of the best of local. If our stories have inspired you, then don't forget there's more you can see on each of the local TV channels' websites. Or why not catch up on previous episodes of the show by visiting bbc.co.uk forward slash digital nation. Until next week, goodbye.